Hello and welcome to the Penny Stamp Speaker Series in collaboration with the University of Michigan Taubman College of Architecture and Urban Planning Lecture Series. I'm Tom Moran, an Associate Professor at Taubman College, and it is my honor to introduce today's event featuring designer, performer, and educator Teresa Ruler from the studio The Rodina. The Rodina is a post-critical design studio with an experimental practice drenched in strategies of performance art, play, and subversion. The Rodina invents ways in which experience, knowledge, and relations are produced and preserved. In their work, Teresa and her partner Vit explore the spatial and interactive possibilities of virtual environments as a space for new thoughts and aesthetics that come forward from between culture and technology. The studio works mostly for cultural clients such as the Harvard GSD, Sonic X Foundation, and Hyundai Card Library Seoul. This event was conceived in partnership with the Taubman College Faculty Research Cluster Beta Matter, of which I'm a member, working to critically engage with XR tools for their deployment in design and pedagogical applications, both locally and nationally, working on issues pertaining to mixed reality as they relate to material and spatial practices while rethinking our experiences within these overlapping physical and digital environments. How do we make freedom and playfulness, traditionally granted to artists, accessible to a wider audience? And how do we design situations or objects that stimulate activity and participation that could lead to a transformation in a viewer or a social context? Please join me in welcoming Teresa Ruler to explore the answers to these questions. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Collective Worlding. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks, uh, Dean Jonathan Messi, Katie Cole, and Christina Hamilton for inviting me. And big thanks to Ishan Paul for putting it all together. This lecture is called Collective Worlding, and it's composed into three chapters. Each chapter has a life component. Today, together, we will look at the practice of performative design, its methods, tools, inspirations, and selected projects. Here we go. Our studio is like a laboratory. We look at our projects from different perspectives. Every project we do, we think which areas it touches and where do we want it to be. Um, for that, we use axis thinking. We would like to be in the middle of these axes. For example, experimentation is important, but in uh, what degree does it allow uh, for experimentation when we also want to have an excellence in our projects? Um, context, imagination, technology, concept. Those are all important. So we as designers are trying to look at the, at the future and how our projects uh, form, uh, form those futures. But everyone can have a different, uh, different access thinking, so you can try to sketch it out yourself. So let's ask in the first chapter, how can design leads towards transformation of self and potentially social change? How do we invite alienated audience to share and experience situations as active part of our design? My answer is through performance in design. Design has capacity to leave, to con to leave the constraints of an object-centric practice. The design discourse is frequently about experience and event rather than something static, like used to be um, a text, a poster, image. So what if we design situations or processes? And ultimately, can viewers of our design be more affected or even involved in these design situations? That's my question. Because the audience previously conceived as a viewer is now repositioned as a co-producer or a participant. Here, performance has the power to engage viewers, invite them to be part of design processes through exchange, 
through creating new relations and opening dialogues. And hopefully that leads to potential change. So what do we mean by performativity? It's a very complex layered term, but here in performative design, by performativity, we mean active bodies, chance, play and experimentation with design processes. And that's happening in special time and space, which is unique, therefore unrepeatable. Um, all that leads to transformation. But what is special? This transformation is not visible during the performance. It's happening inside, inside the participant. Performative design is thus transformative practice. But how to invite participants inside your situation to co-create it and play with it? That's my question, because it's so difficult. People just don't want to easily join such events, especially if it's a bit more performative. So we do it through some props um, and tools. That's why we design graphic scores. So these, these are printed graphic scores and we see them as scripts for possible modes of action. These scores bring more than choreography. They instigate social process. And why? Because these scores, they challenge the hierarchy between um, composer designer and the participant, right? So participants, they can interpret it, interpret these kind of rules or suggestions or invitations on their own and they can play with them. And that's where it gets all very exciting. Inspiration comes from uh, Lucy Lippert. Um, in the 70s, uh, she self-published instruction cards, which served as a catalog um, for conceptual uh, art and performance art, basically fine arts. Five years later, Brian Eno and Peter Schmidt, they uh, published um, another set of instruction cards called Oblique Strategies. And that's something, these cards, they meant to kick um, the creative process, which is, uh, which is stuck. So if you're a musician or artist, or maybe, yeah, somebody creative, you take a card and there is something special for you. You might not listen to it, but you can play with it. And that helps your process. That's why the research on performative design is also published or self-published in the form of set of collectible cards. For now, I have 27 cards, but my idea is to expand this research. Um, it's, it's an inspiring tool um, because it, it reveals possibilities of communication design. Look at all these ingredients. Huh? There's, uh, there are many options uh, for adding new cards. So what are the ingredients of performative design? Um, yeah, and how I would define performative design right now, looking at all these terms. Performative design, it, it is a transformative, integrative and critical design practice that embraces evenness, see it as time and space. And chance, so anything can happen during that. And it has magical power to involve viewers. In early 60s, Ben Patterson was among a small group of Fluxus artists, including Lamonte Young, Yoko Ono, John Cage, and they pushed performance to radical extremes. But here I'm inspired by fine art, by performance art. Eh? Um, look at his performance script in the middle. Isn't it incredible? And that's, uh, that really lets, led us and inspired us to create also um, performative performance scripts. Um, so before each performance happens, we prepare possible modes of action, possible schemes for action. And these are like visual scripts for performance. But Patterson also took musical scripts and turned them into role play instructions. He designed performative games and playgrounds. And we've learned from Patterson. So his practice led us to investigate and create various playgrounds. These playgrounds, we see them as spaces where performance can happen. And inside these spaces, we can listen to each other 
and let others to have a voice. So this one you can see it's called Unionize and it has been conceived as a space to come together, to gather, to discuss together and it's designed um, for rethinking and reshaping culture norms and values within the group of participants. It's a special critical space um, that unwraps um, the heaviness or the difficulties um, of the creative industry. Our playgrounds are designed as spaces for mapping and inviting the imaginary. We embrace collectivist production of future imagination. Um, these playgrounds, they are hopefully safe spaces for experimentation, inclusion, as well as collision and friction. Because whenever you invite people into these spaces, of course, different ideas might clash with each other, different perspectives, but that's welcome. That's, we want to work with that. So yeah, that can happen. Also friction. On the photo, you can, uh, you can see uh, the space, one of the spaces for uncertainty seminars, which is a series of community events, um, expanding the concept of uncertainty as, as a critical tool. Um, and here is another playground during action at the Design Museum London. Participants, they can explore it as Situationist International, so that's an art movement from the 60s, and they explored cities by their very special method called derive, derif in French, and Guy Debord, the leading figure, he defined the derif as a mode of experimental behavior linked to the conditions of an urban society. Basically, that means it's a method of passage through the city. It's an unplanned journey where the city invites you to walk through it without any special plans. So you wander through the urban landscape. And this map is inspired by this method. You could see people there. So, and I talk about participation. So why, why is doing this together with participants important? Why is this participation a key? According to participatory art theorist Claire Bishop, you can read uh, her book, uh, Artificial Health. Participation is a key as it rehumanizes a society fragmented by the repressive instrumentality of capitalist production, where um, human labor is just a resource to be capitalized upon, basically. Here also comes a critique of often misused participatory design, where designers need audience or audiences to precisely finish their task to complete the design. No, no, no. We do not intend to use human resources in such manner. No way. This is different because our approach is all about the process where people have creative freedom to interpret, shake the hierarchies, right? Um, and sharing is really important. Therefore, togetherness can evolve in such spaces, in such playgrounds, right? People have their voice. So it's key to mention Augusto Boal's uh, concept of emancipated spect actor. So it's not just a spectator, it's active acting spectator, spect actor. And that comes from his practice of theater of the oppressed, 70s Brazil. And that's inspired by Paul Freire's uh, book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. But back to playgrounds. We hope to create most needed space to doubt together. We use performative design as means for creating and recreating new relations between people. It's a tool for transformation that enrolls feeling, intellect and imagination as well as tool for education or you might say a bit of de-schooling maybe this playground you can see here it's um, called a map of scattered society and it has a sister which is called map of empathic society and that was exhibited at the fifth istanbul bnl last year the geometric forms that you can see and all these emoji inhabited places on the playground, they work as a vertigo to pull the viewer into the playground. So you want to step in, you want to come in. 
In the Rodina, in the studio, we believe in the importance of caring and playing in order for an empathic society to develop. These playgrounds, they are at the same time fictional maps. There is something very poetic about it, putting it all together. It's geography of imaginary places. This one is currently exhibited at the uh, Van Abbe Museum. We call it Carpet of Voices. Here you can see it a bit, uh, yeah, it's settling down. It's, it's very fresh on this, in this photo. So we're waiting for, we were waiting for one week to, um, to have it kind of more flat. And that Carpet of Voices, it contains, or it's inspired by texts uh, and lectures of influential female rebels activists and also partisans who, I don't want to use that verb, who fight, who advocate uh, for, for uh, racial and non-binary equality. Um, you enter through the pillar of Octavia Butler, so this uh, you must have known know her, right, a sci-fi writer and also at present day uh, she, she is a critic of different hierarchies, of course, and then Angela Davis, political activist. There are more thinkers in that circle of the carpet. Um, and what I can say that all these playgrounds, they steer imagination through collective exploration and play. Inside, participants are becoming explorers, players, the flaneurs, flaneurs and mental travelers. That's inspired, so some of the places in these fictional maps, in these playgrounds, are inspired by Catherine Yusuf and how she examines the earth under colonialism and slavery. Very important book. She initiates conversation between black feminist theory, geography and uh, various earth sciences. She is addressing the politics of the Anthropocene within the context of race, materiality, gender, and geology. It's a very special book, you can see it, A Billion Black Anthropocenes or None. She starts her book with the end of the world, and why not? And this is a quote taken by Master of Contemporary Fantasy by Nora Keita Jemisin. Uh, in Jemisin's book, Fifth Season, we breathlessly follow three super powerful female characters oppressed by the society but they have special powers. And the story, you can read, it's three books. It's a fantasy. And it's an amazing story about different capacities, but also vulnerability of certain communities. And um, partly our maps are, are also inspired by Donna Haraway's concept of multi-species, togetherness and relationality in her epic, iconic book, uh, Staying with the Trouble. And she writes, um, well, how can I say? She wishes us to reconfigure our relations with each other, but also with Earth and all its inhabitants, human and unhuman. I would say, and I would add, I don't have that book here on the slide, but also there's a huge inspiration by Ursula Le Guin and her uh, a series of, of uh, fantasy books. But yeah, I can add it maybe later. Let's go and dive into a life experience right now. Um, we will all go together to spatialaffairs.epfl pavilions, uh, which is a Swiss website, dot ch. Uh, where we're going to meet together and experience something together. Yeah, so see you there. Okay, hi everyone. Do you, do you hear me live? Yeah, so this is the, this is the first live entry. Welcome, welcome to the talk. Very exciting uh, because now I can guide you through the space. Hopefully on the top, I left it on the top, you can still join in spatialaffairs.epfl pavilions. And you can follow me in this exciting virtual exhibition. 
uh, which we which we created uh, last year for the Ludwig Museum, Museum of Contemporary Art in Budapest, but also in in collaboration with the with the Swiss institution um, EPFL Pavilions, and. All together, it's also exhibited as part of the project Beyond Matter at German amazing institution of contemporary art and technologies, which is called ZKM of Karlsruhe. So this is a museum in Karlsruhe. And we are now virtually here. I see already people entering to this space. Super exciting to see you everyone here. <laughs> you have these yellow avatars popping around. And through visiting this space, you can actually click on some of the clickable objects, these kind of virtual bodies, virtual organs, and those will take you into exploring different net art. So this is an, a first kind of native show in its native environment of an internet art. Um, yeah, and we really wanted to bring that experience of how do you exhibit internet art in its more kind of natural uh, habitat and this is the result so yeah you can see it from here uh, you can visit all of these artworks by clicking on them and you can dive into different projects that might be more contemporary artworks, but even also some more historical ones, like really the, the net art of the internet. But yeah, it's uh, it's just something I really wanted to show you. And uh, you can use the chat. So I am very curious for those who are online right now. Um, can you can you write uh, can you write down? Um, what are you drinking right now? Uh, I'm curious if you are more coffee, tea persons, if you drink water, what are you drinking right now? I'm drinking coffee, but I'm curious, what are you drinking right now? Or you don't have to be drinking like right now, but maybe you have a cup next to your computer for the lecture and I see more coffees coming. Are you a tea person? Or smoothie? <laughs> yeah, there is a sound so you can mute it. There's, there's a button on the bottom. Coffee with whiskey. Wow, someone really has a right today. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to this evolving ecosystem. And I'm really, really curious what you think about this live experience together. Uh, because we really wanted to bring more avatars, more visitors together um, to have this experience of different net art together. And it's all built and coded by us in the studio. But yeah, I will let you exploring. And I think I can I can ask Ishan again um, to turn on the continuation for the second chapter of the lecture. I think this is already very exciting to see everyone in. And let's go back and follow the lecture. Thank you. And see. OK, we are back in chapter two, design environments, cohabitation, togetherness, and what you could experience on that website, it's, it's more about matter and bodies and bodies as organs and what would be a technological organ, for example, and it's all built in one very special environment. Okay, we should start the second chapter. So it's about dealing with design as a living ecosystem. That's what I want to say with its relations and connections. Um, so how will future generations see our time and what will remain for them? What kind of world is result of our work, of our labor? What planet are we passing on to them? What will be left from all beautiful images and seductive designs we create? This is a future fossil. We see fossil as the remain of the age when humans, us, 
irreversibly change the geological setup of the planet. So that's how I would describe the age of Anthropocene, basically. However, these are morphing bodies, hybrids between geological, technological and biological bodies. And I call them pickled humans. While we were rendering all these pickled humans, the fossils, the future fossils, we worked on publication that gathers fascinating knowledge. It contains essays uh, about intersectional feminism, forensic architecture, alternatives to capitalism. It's, it's, it's really full of amazing texts and, and, and thoughts. And we were desperate to activate this important knowledge which is locked inside the book. Because honestly, who reads such a theoretical book? It's a difficult to read. How to make content accessible and attractive to people who don't typically read such books. That was our challenge. How to make it more inclusive. How to transform the content into a spatial experience. So what if spreads become walls and you can walk around them? What happens when the book becomes environment? Yeah, we build it. You can explore it as a player. Hereby, the top top view of the main architecture of the central area. So basically, you start in the area of of feminism, and then you can uh, you can discover way more. Let's uh, let's look at it. Uh, what I want to say also, this is a meta book, and why meta? Because you collect uh, you collect this book um, inside the book, and. Um, if you're a player, player with the highest score, you can also win the book. But that was a plan for event for the launch of the book. So um, it's not active anymore, but you can enjoy um, the video, um, the, the play through the game. I guess you get the idea. You can also see it on our Vimeo. Um, so turning physical book into a video game um, raises a particular question. How can designers create virtual worlds as alternatives and proposals to the current world we live in? And with that, I mean the world uh, we fantasize um, is not necessarily an escape from reality. Uh, it's rather a wish and we do that, all of us, hopefully, through our imagination. We sculpt and plan virtual worlds. We create unstable surfaces that are in constant change in the movement, in time, in feeling. Because tools, software, knowledge and hardware for such world making are widely accessible. Why should they be left only for commercial purposes in hands of companies of entertaining industry? No, artists, designers, architects can use game engines and virtual worlds as their medium. World making is a powerful force in constructing our dreams and desires. Last year, when COVID-19 locked us all in our homes, in the moment of extreme, extreme uncertainty and increasing isolation, we can all remember how difficult that was, we've been prototyping some tools for spending time together. We did our first virtual performance of the grid uh, from the commercial streaming platforms. Together with Jessica Deira, we created a bidding event where users could buy virtual playgrounds from us. 
So this virtual performance had a gamified participatory elements in it. Uh, practical question. Um, how can we move our playgrounds into virtual world? How is performance inside virtual worlds relevant to us, to designers? How can we perform inside these virtual worlds that we build? And how can we make online visitors feel close to each other? Huh? This togetherness. Um, the project was called Playbird. And playbur is a term and uh, it basically means that your free time is actually work, like on Twitch. You have fun, but it's actually labor and somebody else is uh, making profit on that, on your time, on your fun. And this is typical for, for the platform capitalism, um, TikTok, Instagram or Instagram stories, Facebook, you name it. And in Playbur exhibition, in this virtual exhibition, we are looking at how work and play are becoming merged, unseparable. Um, good to mention Ching, Ching Jungwon, South Korean scholar. He explores how play becomes hijacked by the capitalist mode of production. He writes, transition from the industrial society to the information society takes a play form. The play is very important here. The next virtual performance that we experimented on was done with Handy Kim and it was all about inhabiting a disproportionately huge non-human virtual bodies and sharing our desires. In the platform capitalism, in the age of self-performance, on social media and these days on a never-ending conference calls and streaming platforms. We all perform what we do. We perform our jobs. It's us, ultimate workers. We live in the world of colors and hope, happily exploited, performing like mad. We pioneered the online performance in live multiplayer mode, built with a custom code here in the studio well, not here, because the studio is somewhere else. Now I'm uh, making this lecture from my home, actually. Uh, but we build it with the custom code developed by us. Um, and yeah, you can see it um, later. I will show you another part of it. Um, but it's important to mention something connected with Playbur. Isabel Harbison, Harbison, she writes about how um, consuming and producing images and um, creates addiction and this addiction makes us to work for free, right? In the service of the global corporate expansion and colonization of our personal data, information, images, yeah, you name it. Uh, you can read her, her book, Performing Image. It's, it's, um, it's quite new and it's by MIT Press. So let's dive into one of these playable um, parts of the virtual show together in the second chapter. I would like us all to experience it. So let's go. Huh? Uh, let's go to desires.tetem.nl and we will all meet together there at desires.tetem.nl. So see you there, yeah? Hi everyone. Hi everyone. Do we hear each other? Welcome back to this virtual uh, live uh, part of the lecture. I would like to take you on a little ride here in the live space where hopefully more people will pop up very soon on desires.tetem.nl. Uh, I see people coming already. And here you can see you have different virtual bodies. There are all these uh, very cute avatars that uh, we've, we've sculpted together with Handy Kim. Uh, this is so exciting. I want to take a screenshot. <laughs> you are so cute. Um, for this live entrance, Inside Desires, you can see huge avatars inhabited by me and Handy. And one day we gave a virtual tour across all these playgrounds and their meanings. So we sculpted these huge objects that you can visit. And each object has a meaning for us and it's connected with kind of human desire 
I'm now looking at one, for example, the lifestyle one. Eh? So this one, this playground above me is connected with desire of lifestyle, having a special lifestyle. I will fly through. This one is connected with the richness, being the, the wealthy one, owning, owning, owning. And here we go for fame and power. That's another desire, a poss possibility for desire to be famous and powerful. But we have also other ones, for example, being addicted to cleanliness, cleanness, beauty. And the playground above it is dedicated to that. I would like to ask everyone in the chat. Hello, dears. Could you, because you're all protected, this is a safe space, you're all protected by your um, special name of your avatar, so we don't know who writes this, which is nice because it gives you safe space to really express. Um, can you write down what uh, what is your secret desire? What is your secret desire? What is your special desire? What do you what do you know about yourself? What do you really what are you looking for? Because what's interesting about desires that we feel we might feel them as kind of needs. It's a call to do something. We need it. But do we actually really need it? And that's the question. It's it's maybe this need for having always adventurous life, for example. It's it's not a need, we can survive with it, but it's just something we are addicted to. So what are your desires? What is your desire? You can write it into the chat. Lifestyle, okay. Uh -huh. I, um, for a long time, I was in, not beauty and addiction, as designer, you might say so. I was more in, not luxury hunting. I was more here in the echo dreams and fantasy worlds. Yeah, to play more. I always dreamed about like a kind of ecological futures that we would end up together with the planet on a really good note in a way and we would live happily ever after on a beautiful, green, healthy planet. I hope, I still hope for that. So this is like my, my secret desire to be seen yes yeah? someone angry Kalians writes i want to be seen someone writes to find my own definition of meaning okay this is beautiful <laughs> thank you everyone and uh, we will continue with the lecture there will be also q a at the end so we can all connect together see you see you uh soon eh? okay welcome back from Desires at Tetem. I hope you had fun. Um, what I would like to say that it's a strange phenomena, uh, but while creating all these virtual worlds, we realize that they are more inclusive, affordable and accessible. Because you don't have to be anywhere physically, you can experience them as a player from your home or from another place. So they are more inclusive um, or accessible than some galleries, theaters or schools you can explore them freely like that. I mean, you need to be online. Uh, since 2020, we designed and programmed nine different um, virtual multiplayer environments for different culture events. Here is a little list. So if you want to explore more and dive into it, like, please do so. Yeah, there are quite some. Um, yeah, you can just try that. But not now, we will go into the chapter number three. Uh, thinking about the game environments, let's look outside. I mean, from the window, let's say. Let's look at the world around us. Let's get involved in the matter of the physical world by asking how to design um, to reveal rather than hide. Let's not be uh, afraid to unwrap more, more complex and difficult stories. One day, we looked at planet surface through the gaze of a satellite and combined this imagery with uh, what is underground, what is hidden to our eyes. 
infrastructures and maps of heavy industries and underground mines and quarries, they have a lot to tell. And my question is, has capitalism made Earth a purely economic resource? So let's unwrap the complexity. Where exactly is mining happening? Who profits and who doesn't have a voice in carbon uh, extractivism? So we identified several extraction locations of different chemical and rare earth met uh, metals and elements, like for example, neodymium, yttrium, palladium, but, but also titanium, and then more easy ones, copper and gold. And why copper and gold? We wrote an essay about massive resource extraction behind design surfaces. So that's why we use these elements or selection of these chemical elements to look at what is behind the design. Because we all use these elements in our devices or when we print. Um, all our smartphones, our super 5K screens, everything in the studios we use is made out of these very special, unique elements that are taken from the ground. Yeah, all is made from scarce resources, chemical elements and rare earth metals, and we extract them from the upper crust of the planet. So capitalism is basically chewing the planet it depends on. But of course we depend on capitalism, so it's a, it's a paradox. But great to know and be aware of that everything that surrounds us has been carefully crafted, innovated and shaped by us designers. Design theorist Alice Twemlow, she talks about visibility, measurability and direct impact of the damage by design that puts us into and the planet into direct danger by products and even values we might share or our lifestyle. She writes, the damage being done to our planet by the products, processes and values generated by design is increasingly visible and measurable. Specifically in this design and in the essay, we problematize the old conception of norms such as binary or patriarchy. And why? Because norms, they cut through rather than connect. It's never male or female in these old binaries or human versus the planet. No, we care for intersectional equality, togetherness. We are in it together and we are on board of one particular and unique spaceship called Earth. Talking about togetherness, uh, we care for these multi-species because we are our own example here. We know for long that our own bodies are, are vessels of interconnected organisms. We are earthlings interwoven and knotted with microbes and bacteria. Here I'm following again Donna Haraway's concept of this relationality and, and entanglements. To visually support the narrative of the essay that we called Accidental Geopoetics, we created geoponchos. These are costumes for role play, through which human body connects to the planetary body. And how to activate it? Yeah, by action. So some methods um, we've learned from Marta Araujo, Brazilian performer and activist who pioneered the power of poncho. Uh, already 40 years ago, she experimented with different forms of embodiment, uh, entrapment and collective wear wearables. Important to mention here are also experiments in pedagogy and games, um, a process called de-schooling by Chilean architect and educator uh, Casanueva, Manuel Casanueva, and this led to series of architectural slash performative exercises in 17s, in 70s. What you can see on the photo, at the time Casanueva questioned how people relate to each other and the space around them. So they make these experiments. And how can be various spaces constructed with understanding speciali specialities where living bodies interact. So it's all about action and interaction. And um, different tokens, spatial props, and these ponchos, they are powerful tools. So we learn from, from Marta Araujo, we learn from Casanueva, and 
the one who has um, has them or uses them or let's say the one who wears these ponchos and carries these tokens can become something or somebody else through the means of role play or performance uh, but through means of role play you can become the other somebody else in role play you are navigating the perspectives of others and otherness and that's accompanying our essay accidental Poe geopolitics and what you can see on the photo it's performative design intervention that happened in Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam and the whole museum became a stage a place where real and imagination meet together remember performance transforms viewer participant and you the architect designer the creator performative design brings other values than monetary it's about different things than money like understanding sharing joy excitement or when we do it together with participants it brings the new the special value of being together and it brings this collective collective memory and all sorts of feelings and emotions yeah in accidental geopoetics performers truly became stones and chemical elements from the upper crust of the planet and they felt deeply entangled with what they imagined earth is feeling but the special moment of connection happened after a few hours so this whole performative event lasts for six hours eh? so it's it's not an immediate transformation it's not immediate change you need to give it time the message would be use your imagination to amplify what matters use your designs proposals to make stories to touch people in a way that it's not measured and we aim for collective storytelling Yes, it's a challenge right now to talk about all this playfulness and utopic futures and fantasy and transformation through playfulness and playgrounds when so many people are struggling at the moment, struggling to survive. Or also in the pandemic or in different waves of, of pandemic as precarious workers and of course living in oppressive regimes or different power grips and so on and so on so we should use that privilege that we can talk about it and think about the positive change that we would like to make and work on it use our talents use our time use our resources to either ship them somewhere where it's more needed in communities where it's needed or to design things situations experiences um, to aim for it, to work on it, to do it. Because this situation allows us to critically reflect on our current experience, all of us. So I would like us to consider how such lessons might influence our lives and design or architectural activities moving forward. And we can discuss it in the chat of the last live experience that we are going to dive into together uh, we will meet in the dev.progressbar.club so dev.progressbar.club and we can discuss it there all together so that's everything from me right now regarding the talk the presentation the lecture and we are going to meet online here okay so go there find me there and um, yeah, thank you so much. See you. Bye.
Well, thank you, Teresa, for the presentation. Did you did you want to go over um, to the progress bar with the audience first, or would you like me to start uh, the discussion? Um, you can start the discussion. I'm there in that world as well. So I'm right now live in the Zoom and also live in that world. So we can find each other both ways. So maybe you can just, uh, if you have questions. Uh... Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, first, I want to just remind the audience that they can share questions or thoughts on YouTube. And I can uh, voice them here with Teresa so we can discuss them. Um, yeah, I guess I have one question observation. Um, first, thanks for showing all the work. It's a really extraordinary body of work. Um, but I think you know. started, yeah, yeah. You started the talk with an observation that seems to drive a lot of the work of your practice, which is that participation is hard. You know, it, it's, it seems like there is a lot of resistance from people generally to participating. Um, and so uh, I guess I have a, you know, <laughs> yeah, I have a multi-pronged question based on that uh, observation that you've made. Um, one, why do you think that is? Like, you know, what about human psychology makes us, you know, nervous about joining in? Um, and then, you know, because I, I think a lot of the kind of live performances you've done have very smartly come up with techniques, you know, to get people into the experience, into the participation. Um, and then I think the second question is, do you see the digital experiences you've made, the virtual experiences you've made um, kind of as a technique to invite people in? You know, do you find that people are more willing to participate in a virtual world than they maybe are um, in physical space? This is great. Uh, thanks for these great uh, double questions. <laughs> yeah, I, well, let's start with the psychology of joining. I think that's quite interesting term that you just introduced. People are creative, people are stubborn, people have different characters and above those characters and their kind of behavior, there is also their moods. Huh? People can be moody. You never know what you're kind of entering into people have their own universes with them so it's quite particular and special you're right um so what i would say was difficult about participation is this is this notion of having a stage and when you're entering this kind of stage eyes are on you you're kind of in the middle of that gaze you are the kind of you're yourself you know that you're kind of hopefully in a nice way kind of work with yourself as to not to be objectified but you know that the gaze is on you so you have to work with that notion and some people they prefer to observe it's in their nature it's more um you know they they prefer to stand maybe further away and look what's happening on the stage and those could be called like directors or observers huh? they have different functions and that's the same with the audience some people want to test and try out how is it when the gaze is on you to be an actor or spect actor this active active body in the play and some people just like to stand back and think about what they would do or just have that imagination and watch so those are the watchers the directors yeah so that's for me these kind of two characters and you can kind of carefully craft and design spaces for interaction with knowing there will always be someone who wants to stand way back and observe everything and will be as happy as that, really enjoying, but not necessarily from the, from the kind of immediate connection with the, with the life elements. Um, and some people have to show up, <laughs> just want to wanna show what they have. And uh, virtual worlds and building these virtual worlds definitely brings um, a lot of smoother interaction through the chat and anonymity of, uh, of your kind of virtual avatar because somehow you're yourself, but you're safe at home. And entering these virtual spaces, you can take, of course, your body has a different shape, even different yeah, forms and colors. It's non-human body. We could see it before. So there are all sorts of different avatars. And that really helps you to interact also more freely 
of course, you might think, okay, this is built with certain tools and I have to sign in with my email, but actually this is built that every email you put in, it will work. So you can stay really safe and anonymous in this process. And that's why when I ask about different questions, like for example, desires, people can write it down because we don't know who that really is. You don't need to use your VPN. You are just protected by the avatar itself, which I think it's very nice for sharing um, sometimes more difficult things or things it's, we don't necessarily talk about while not being with friends or family. But yeah, here we can do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it seems like that's almost like a technique within the technique. You know, as I saw you inviting people to share, even if it's just what they're drinking, there's a kind of uh, eroding of that boundary between not participating and participating. You know, even if you're just sharing something trivial about yourself, it, it seems to kind of enroll people in the experience, even if it's just, um, you know, sharing that you're drinking coffee in the chat. Um, yeah, I, I definitely have more questions. I, I'm wondering if there's anything from the audience that I can share right now. Um, but may, maybe I could just kind of share my own experience with these kinds of participatory events. And then, you know, and then I think it for me bleeds into a question about audience, you know? So mm -hmm. I don't know if you know the satirical newspaper, The Onion, um, you know, but they, they have a headline from one of their stories, which reads something like, oh no, the actors are coming into the audience. You know, that like, yeah. that there's certain expectations about a performance <laughs> and suddenly you're made into a part of the performance and it's terrifying. Um, and I think it just, it gets at something very, you know, truthful about human experience. And I think for me, part of it is just the like loss of autonomy. You know, so suddenly you are, you know, forced into some kind of behavior that you're uncomfortable with. Um, and I'm not saying there's not something to learn there, but I, I, I don't just to add to the kind of human psychology discussion. Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I agree. And I have to say, I, I want to share now because I also hate these situations. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is also happening throughout the education in schools, you know, in classrooms, there's always like some more playful element and then goes to theaters as well. Yeah, actors start running uh, uh, around the audience uh, seating area and suddenly you have to kind of be part of the stage and part of the show. And I hate these moments. <laughs> and that's why I designed this performative design to try to work with um, and overcome my fear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that makes sense. I mean, I've, I've heard stand-up comedians refer to doing stand-up as the ultimate overcoming of fear. You know, that that's one reason to do it is just to confront fear directly. Um, we have some questions coming in, but I wanna ask just one, one question about audience. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the spaces that your work appears in are kind of already institutions or you know, art institutions are just contexts yeah. where people might be ready or more willing to engage the kind of work. Um, but then again, you have these digital spaces, which I think can reach a much broader audience. And so, yeah, I'm just curious about how you think about your audience, what kind of scalability there might be to the different kinds of projects you do in terms of audience. Um some of the virtual clubs that we've built are tested for more than like 250 live clubbing bodies, chatting and having a party on even like three different stages. Like you would go to a music festival and you have the freedom to visit different tents or rooms with the different parties going on live. So imagine you are on a virtual festival. There is like, 250 other people there and, and you can freely visit different musical experiences, different lectures that are running at the same time. So this was one of our biggest challenge to kind of bridge this experience into virtuality. Um, so yeah, one of them is this progress bar space, which is uh, which was never opened actually because, because of Corona and some other issues, but the space is fully working and fully ready. So that's why I wanted to share because it's also exciting 
that some projects have a really, they have a short lifetime, especially for music, uh, for the music festivals. So they, they start and run throughout the weekend and then they're closed. But there's so much work, so much labor, so much programming, designing, everything. So that's why I wanted to share one of these kind of more abandoned places that are here. They are online, but just nobody goes to anymore because they were designed for a specific audience type for a party just for one weekend. And that's it. So I just, that's, for example, one like kind of temporality or also ephemer, ephemerality of that space, which is quite special when you think about also communication design, which is my kind of discipline, the communi being communication designer, you really work with different temporalities and especially with things that will fade out in a quick time. They will, they will become timely, they will, um, yeah, they will just be gone. So it's something to think about when we also work with performance and with these virtual spaces. So maybe this audience is already parting somewhere else. And yeah, this, this, but this space still exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I certainly have a lot more thoughts, but um, the questions are starting to really roll in. So um, let me read some to you here. Um, I'm interested in the relationship between aesthetics and participation. Are you interested in participants to challenge the aesthetic regime of your work? Or do you hope they remain within the bounds? No, that's exactly uh, why I why I wanted to stand um, step out of uh, what is called more this participatory design, where you really need your audience to complete the task for you, when you need to have a kind of overall final touch above the aesthetic outcome of the design. So I want to step out of that. Uh, I'm not really interested in this exact participatory design. I'm more excited by inviting people. And when you invite someone, you understand that they are creative beings. They have their voices. They have their ideas. They really want to do something special. So you are designing that experience more openly. And you understand that you're working with the process rather than beautiful results. Which, of course, I will be honest, it leads to a messy outcome, yeah, complex, messy outcome, because people are creative. They will definitely try to break your rules. They will try to make it their own. They want to own it. So they will read in between the lines of instructions. They will make something crazy. They love it. But for me, that brings excitement. And that's how I, I can improve and make more interesting other engagements in the future. So I kind of learn from my own mistakes and I learn from creativity of, of, of people. And with that, I can build next performances differently. So I work with all these mistakes and the outcomes could be messy because it's more about this processual visual knowledge that we create together. Great. Um... So the next question comes from Adam Miller. I'm interested in your concept of playbore. Uh, the encroachment of work into all aspects of life seems problematic, exhausting, sym symptomatic of capitalism. Do you consider yeah. participation as labor or play? Is not participating actually a way to resist labor exploitation? Uh. Difficult. This is really entangled that huh? because I play with the fire <laughs> in a way that uh, the participation itself, where it feels it feels playful and imaginary and having your fantasies, but still perf performing, um, being part of something. It's also if you would consider that this is an let's say design work or an artwork where you participate it's also labor as well so this is being a bit uh, double-sided coin or double -sided. it's it's paradoxical to work with it uh you are right you're right and it's it's really special these days to try to unwrap what the labor is in the platform capitalism and the current kind of late um extractive and and also labor extractive capitalism and what does it mean to be um a worker that lives in post-Fordism, this kind of post-Fordist worker. So um, in the lecture, I, I quoted uh, Chin Jung-won, this, this South Korean scholar. 
uh, he talks about the play form that is connected with the change from industrial society, as we know, the Fordism kind of industrial society into the post-industrial, into the digital, virtual information society. So this, the play, the notion of playfulness and play uh, is super important. And all these, let's say, all these platforms that we use, like also, also we can say the conferencing tools as well, like Zoom right now that we're using or uh, being on Twitch, ha having, creating our Instagram stories, this all touches on the user's free time, on the user's playtime. That's something very special. And the, the term playber, it originated uh, in 2005 from the game industry when, when the gamers themselves start to criticizing that when they play, they can also earn money with their, with their games. And this is when it all started as a term. And now it's a kind of like a snowball. Now it's way bigger and it contains all these special term about like kind of virtual exploitation, the post for this worker and the, the, the free time being monetized by yeah, by the by the platform cap capitalism, basically. Yeah, but it's a huge, uh, it's a huge topic. My one of my favorites. So it's a great question. I don't know whether I answered really. It's so yeah. <laughs> so. Um, oh, so that first question was by the Plethora Project. Oh, just getting the chats in order here. But uh, so Tanner Vargas has a follow up to Plethora's, and. Here it is. Uh, how is agency defined, challenged, subverted, or empowered in the projects? Um, what is its malleability? Mm, interesting. Yeah, maybe that's uh, that's a good one for the last project that I showed. This accidental geopoetics. When um, the challenging part was that the participants were young designers who never did any performance and they volunteered, they were, they were basically volunteers into joining and creating this six hour long performance in the Stellarik Museum. And of course, when you work with people, they have their own agency, right? They, they wanna do what they want to do, but still they're maybe excited to test something different. So this was their special evening because they did this long performance. And somehow um, it was designed the way that we really hoped, and it happened, which is exciting, that after some time, after a long time, after a few hours of performing, they will kind of all land they will all merge and embed into their role play, into their performative roles, which were connected with the ground and with the earth and with the, with the special chemical element that we are kind of as humankind extracting from the planet itself. And that was this moment when really kind of their agencies started to mingle with the imaginary, with their own imagination of the agency of the planet itself, of the agency of, of the matter that is non-human matter, which is stones and there's these, all these earthly chemicals and elements, that somehow this performance and this role play really bridged this gap between what's human and non-human. And they, they kind of asserted their their minds into what the earth might feel. And that was very exciting. So that's, that's maybe subverting some sort of kind of norms of like being just human and thinking about human centric design and always it's the humans used to be always since humanism for centuries, we've been in the middle of everything. And lately and recently, basically it's about decentering only ourselves from that focus and, and focusing on, on, on different types of bodies, on the planetary body or something that it's maybe of other importance. And we hope that this performance, Accidental Geopoetics, will, will subvert this notion of power that the human, human body is the powerful one. And we wanted to just subvert it, play with it, and, and hopefully that happened. I really believe so. Yeah, this is a good question. It was experiment, yeah, it's experiment. Um, 
So, well, we're waiting on more questions from the audience. I have, I have a few, and they're not so much questions, well, like they're questions, but more I want to maybe ask you to elaborate on some things um, about your practice. So there's a piece of writing, um, Action to Surface, that you made in 2015. Um, and if we yeah. kind of trace the arc of your practice, I think increasingly, and you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, you seem interested in these virtual experiences. And so um, may maybe I could quickly read a sentence here from the writing and then maybe ask you to expand a little bit on that thesis um, so that the audience can kind of know what you, your aims were there. And then I just ask you to reflect on, has that changed you know how ha how have those ideas adapted or changed or evolved with your more recent interest in virtual spaces so here, here's just one line the, the question that you want to answer in this piece of writing is how does performativity influence the surface um, and i think a follow-up is you know you examine um, performance art, graphic design, craftsmanship, and vernacular action, you know, those seem like a kind of different milieu than the digital screen and the digital space, so. Definitely. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, quite some time ago, and I was sure. really exciting, <laughs> excited excited by, by discovering that uh, I can experiment on that level. Uh, but during the time, and especially working with uh, with clients who still ask designers or ask the studio to work with them to kind of help them communicate or create campaigns for exhibition. So with that, we're working with that. We we really wanted to still bring graphic design as part of kind of service based design. Of course, by service based, I don't want to say it's exactly like kind of exactly like the word serving is quite problematic here because it's more, our approach here is more dialogical. We really wanna talk with the client what they might need and they might not know yet. And we will really help them out together. I don't wanna also say help because it's a collaborative way, uh, but through working with clients, this, um, this kind of idea of making virtual spaces and experimenting with more uh, digital and virtual performance is the way that is exciting for both parties, not only for us, the studio, but also for them to exhibit or um, to just invite us for a, a short experiment. So yeah, and of course there is different notion of production behind it because when you do um, when you design something virtually the production is more uh, on your side of course you rent out the servers you you have your code and you do that but if you have to produce a physical installation physical performative intervention real physical performance you need quite a lot of resources you need a lot of money but you also need a lot of material um, so that might be quite quite uh, demanding for culture clients, for, for exhibition spaces, for galleries, museums to really do that. Because, for example, we did one in, in a really, really big one for 20,000 people, and that was in Korea. And we had to print, for that, we had to print that amount of stickers, for example, for a sticker interaction. So people would do performance with a sticker. They would place a sticker on the wall. And for that, you need 20,000 stickers. So imagine what is the, and that's kind of not a big production for uh, for this Korean event, but for us, we thought, okay, there's a lot of waste, a lot of colors, a lot of printing on these stickers, a lot of special glue. So it becomes, yeah, you think about materiality of those projects. So the, the virtual spaces, they feel more lighter, easier, more accessible. So that's why, um, that's why uh, you can find me more on that page now. Um, I think we're we're coming up on time here, but I have one more question yeah. related to that relationship between the kind of IRL work you do and the digital work. Um, you know, just uh -huh. as I'm actually sitting here moderating this conversation. And I'm moving between different you know, browser windows on two monitors. 
and I'm watching myself in Zoom and then also, you know, through, you know, through a piece of broadcasting software. Um, and I'm also a little bit distracted by other yeah. things like texts and Slack messages. Um, so I just wonder about the nature of attention and how they differ between the kind of in real life work where, you know, people are engaged, they're bodily engaged, they're maybe engaged with others, they're collaborating with their hands. And then the kind of attention that one has or can give to a digital experience, just how, how you feel about that when kind of changing norms. And I would even say like, uh, what's the right way to put it? Like mo moralizing, you know? I think some people yeah. see distraction as a sort of moral failing or yeah. one's ability to focus as a kind of like moral uh, high ground, let's say not high ground, but you, you get my point that um, there, there are these different, right. yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering if you could, you know, reflect on that a bit in the different kinds of work you do. Yeah, you're right. We live in a world of uh, this destruction, destructive uh, destructions and dis the, the interruptions and, and chaotic images. Maybe that's why I quoted in the lecture also Isabel Harbinson and her uh, research on image and how we are producing tons and millions and millions of images. And we also consume those images. Um, so uh, if, you, if you think about your Instagram account or TikTok, it's all like, yeah, you're consuming those images as well. You're be becoming addicted to all of these images. And with, uh, we live in this kind of world of chaos and mess, visual, visual mess on our screens. This is something that we have to be, we are aware of, but uh, how do we work with that? So making some virtual, uh, virtual spaces and performances, we play with this notion of being image creators, being image producers at the same time, right? But important to say is that the, what is this performance? Because we have to think about it when we create these spaces. If it's physical uh, a performance, it's, it's more like an act, a gesture, activity or notion of action, right? And, and this brings these immediate feelings, I call them values in the lecture. So for example, emotions and feelings. So it's becoming very emotional when you do it when you join this performance with your physical body, it's, it's you with your feelings, the human body together with other humans, it's, it's quite uh, sensual. If you do it online virtually, it's, you are dis dis distracted, you are far away from that. And maybe you might feel that your body is more, I will try to show this, it's more connected uh, with this kind of, with, with your mouse, for example. So you're becoming part of the computational body, which is, for me as well, exciting, but of course it's, it's, it's completely kind of interrupting this smooth process of the older kind of performativity, the physical one. <laughs> and um, the research that I started, uh, I'd say seven years ago, I don't know, some time ago, it was really, how can I, how can I look at communication design through the lens of action, physical action of bodies, considering um, myself as creator, as designer, a producer of different surfaces, like graphic design surfaces. But already at that time, when I talked about, th thought about this research, I engaged myself in many visual projects, of course, right, as a studio. So we do a lot of experiments on this level. But I thought these surfaces are not only static and printed like books and posters at that time, but it's a lot of animation, a lot of moving image and of course a lot of web design user experience design so it's it's all kind of connected with this movement in time and space and that can be virtual but you're tom you're absolutely right it's it's distract it's 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 really interrupt interrupting the kind of flow of the smooth performance life together and yeah, for example, when we talk about togetherness, um, I don't think we can compare with this virtual world feeling together when we are physically together. It's just incomparable. It's it's different level of exchange. Yeah. Well, th thank you so much um, for all your time and sharing your work and your thoughts. Um,
I, th I think we're yeah I think we're at time so I don't I don't want to keep yeah. you or the audience any longer but yeah thanks again on behalf of the school and and me and you know Beta Matter and you know everyone here um, on YouTube so thank you so much. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>